Well, I have a grandson who's autistic, which is the immediate reason. Uh, it's interesting because I did train in neurology many years ago. And in those three years, I never saw a patient with autism. And it was very rare then. And then I was a developmental neurobiologist for 25 years. I never heard a talk on autism, even though it was thought to be a, a brain development problem. It wasn't a single talk in 25 years, which is quite remarkable. Anyway, now it's increased in incidence and it's become a big deal. But it's my grandson, who's now eight, that got me interested in the subject. So the three core features are a problem with social interactions, which is really the crux of the matter, uh, a problem with language, and also a tendency to have restricted interests and repeated stereotypic motor behaviors. So that's so-called autistic triad. And you need to have two of those three and you need to develop them by the age of three to be considered autistic. It is a spectrum, and uh, it's probably the reason for the increase, or at least an important reason for the increase, is that the diagnostic criteria have expanded uh, enormously. So at one end is classic autistic kids that are at the bad end of the spectrum and at the best end of the spectrum uh, is Asperger's syndrome, where they have much less trouble with language and are often very smart. Uh, but it, there's everything in between. And I'm sure you have many colleagues who you can see have features of autism. I'm not so sure it's unorthodox. Uh, it, it's you need to explain what's special about this triad. Why are they held together in this way? And there's, besides those three core features, there are often other associated features, seizures in 30%, cognitive impairment in 50%, and behavioral abnormalities like temper tantrums and feeding and sleeping disorders and so on uh, are often found in addition to this core triad. So I think the major question, the intellectual question, is what holds the core triad together? There's no part of the brain that I'm aware of where if it were disordered would explain this triad while everything else seems to be fine. So what is it? So a simple possibility would be that the problem is an interaction between the child and the caregiver, usually the mother. Because it's been known for many years that if you can't do that properly, if you can't do this thing called joint attention with your mother or caregiver, then you don't learn to speak, you don't learn social skills, you develop restricted interests and not infrequently repeated uh, stereotypic uh, movements. In terms of human evidence, if a child is born deaf, for example, and the parents don't pick it up. If they're deaf, then they would pick it up. But if they're not, uh, and the child is, goes for a year or two or three before they pick it up, that child has a very high increased incidence of autistic features. And if they're born blind and you don't pick it up, uh, that too is often associated with autistic features. And kids that are brought up in orphanages, particularly the big orphanages where you don't get one-on-one -on -one, uh, care at all, like in Romania, for example, uh, these kids, too, develop what's called institutional autism. So I think it's pretty clear that if you interfere with that child, parent, uh, and other children interaction, uh, you could get the triad just from that alone. So it's... Kanner, when he first described this in 1943, noted in his report that uh, the parents of these children were kind of cold and didn't seem to have an interest in people. And you could see where he was going with this, sort of blaming uh, the parents. And then Bettelheim picked up on this and said that it really is the parents and talked about refrigerator mothers and all that stuff. So during the 50s, 60s, uh, it was commonly felt that this is emotional disorder and parents were blamed for it. 
I think they were right in pointing to the relationship as a problem, but they were pointing to the wrong part of the relationship. It's a kid that is abnormal. And the child is abnormal largely for genetic reasons. This is the most genetic of the neuropsychiatric uh, disorders. And so the child is somehow impaired in their ability to interact. And so the question then becomes, if this idea is right, uh, what's the nature of the impairment? And there's lots of ideas. Uh, one idea is that autistic kids don't process faces normally, and that would interfere with the interaction. Now, there is that they don't have uh, any particular uh, drive to interact with something that's biological as opposed to something that's inanimate. Um, another is that they can't intuit what's going on in somebody else's mind, this mind blindness or theory of mind problem. Uh, I think this is very unlikely that any of those things are the primary uh, problem. I think a more likely problem is that there's a problem with attention, a particular type of attention. Uh, there's lots in the literature that suggests that the, these kids have what's called sticky attention, a problem with attention disengagement. When they focus on something, it's very hard to disconnect them from what they're focused on and get them to focus on something else. So shifting from one thing to another seems to be a problem. So the best evidence for that, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is from uh, Landry and Bryson. They published a paper in 2004 uh, where they had three television screens and they put the child, these were five-year-old uh, kids, 30 autistic kids, uh, 30 kids who were Down syndrome kids, and 30 neurotypical kids, uh, you know, balanced for IQ and so on. And they had a focus screen up where the kids were taught to focus on the image, which were just abstract images falling through space in this, on the screen. And then they were to look at a new image that went up in one of the lateral screens and their eyes were tracked electronically to ask how quickly they moved to the new image. And the results seemed very clear cut that if they took down the focus screen image at the time they put up the new stimulus, the autistic kids were as good as the other two groups. But if they left that focus screen image up, then 20% of the autistic kids didn't move at all. And those that did, many of them were delayed. So that says, there are no people here. There's no faces. There's no social interaction. You know, this is simply a problem with attention. And it seems that they have trouble shifting attention from what they're focused on. And my grandson uh, had that in spades when he became autistic because he was one of these regressors. He was okay for a year and a half. And then over a month or two, suddenly he stopped looking at you. He stopped talking and you couldn't get his attention. He would be looking at a wheel spinning or a train going around a track or water falling. And you could poke him in the eye. You could flash lights in his eyes. You could scream in his ears. You just couldn't get his attention. So it's not that he wasn't paying attention. It was just he wasn't paying attention to you. 